Efendim, simultane çevrelere erişim Zoom mobil uygulaması üzerinden gerçekleştirilecektir. Tercüme hizmetlerimizden yararlanmak için oturumlara kişisel kulaklığınızla cep telefonunuz üzerinden ekrana yansıtılan kare kodu okutarak bağlantı sağlamak. Efendim, simultane Aynı çevrelere erişim Zoom mobil uygulaması üzerinden gerçekleştirilecektir. Takmanızı, takmanız yeterli olacaktır. Teşekkür ederiz. Efendim bu oturumda moderatörümüz olan Özer Özkantar'a sözü bırakıyorum. Buyurun hocam. Hi again. Welcome to International Symposium on Cinema and Philosophy again and again. We will go on with our valuable keynote speaker Patricia Pisses and her speech is gonna be Thinking with Fire, Elemental Philosophy and Media Technology. But before her presentation starts, I want to give a very short information about her academic career. So Patricia Pistis is a professor of media studies with a specialization in film studies at the University of Amsterdam. From 2015 until 2019, she was director of research at the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis of the Faculty of Humanities. She is a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences of the Royal Holland Society of Sciences and Humanities and of the Academy of Europe. As a film philosopher, her work investigates the idea of the brain as the screen in relation to neuroscience, psychiatry, and psychedelics. Another field of research investigates media ecologies, ecocritical media, and elemental media. Her latest book is on the poetics of horror in the work of a new generation of women directors. So Professor Isis, We're waiting your speech. Thanks a lot in advance. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I have a PowerPoint to share, which I'm going to try to make work now. <laughs> um, so I hope you can see this. Yeah, we can see. Okay. Your Thanks a lot. Great. All right. Um, so what I would like to share with you indeed is uh, part of a new research pro project, which has to do with thinking with uh, the elements. And I will be focusing, as you can see, on thinking with uh, fire. So much of what I'm going to share is really work in progress. Uh, and I'm going to you know, mention a few of the things and thoughts that I have encountered. And then we can see maybe in the discussion what that would mean. Uh, for our uh, conversations um, and I think my uh, I need to share another screen because this does not work um, so I'll try another one I couldn't, I couldn't move in the other so Oh, yeah, this works. All right. So uh, first to situate a little bit uh, my um, my talk today, um, elemental philosophy and elemental media are actually on uh, on the rise. It is really uh, a type of scholarship that um, uh, has been written about or is is uh, been uh, conducted these days uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, and I just want to mention a few. Uh, that uh, few of the works that have inspired me in my uh, my thoughts. First of all, I should mention actually the work of uh, uh, John Durham Peters, The Marvelous Clouds, the second book here on screen, um, which uh, uh, is a book that was quite seminal uh, for introducing elemental philosophy into media studies. And Durham Peters argues that the time is ripe for a philosophy of media and a philosophy of, me of media needs a philosophy of nature. So one way of understanding this philosophy of nature that is useful for uh, media studies uh, is to really look at um, uh, industries, um, media industries, in the way they really depend on uh, our, you know, the natural resources. So we can think of uh, media as resource images, as uh, Nadia Bozak uh, does, or we can look at uh, the, the raw materials that are necessary uh, to conduct uh, or, or to make media as UC Parica does. Um, 
And so all these um, uh, studies have been looking at a very uh, materialistic way in which we can understand uh, media in relation to, to our nature. Um, elemental philosophy uh, is also um, in itself um, in a, you know, on the rise again, it has been always part of, uh, uh, of philosophy, but to think uh, about and with earth, water, fire uh, and wind, or in Chinese philosophy, to think also about uh, metal and wood uh, as really fundamental uh, elements in our being and even in our thinking uh, is, is really something that we have to uh, return to. Um, uh, one last uh, uh, work that I want to just briefly mention is uh, Wild Blue Media as an example of uh, a media scholar who thinks with water. Uh, and uh, uh, her subtitle is uh, of also Thinking Through Seawater. Um, and in this book, Melody Ju uh, demonstrates that the cool and opaque as epistemologies of seawater um, can be considered as um, um, a medium of non-human perception. And this idea of non-human perception, again, is something that is really uh, interesting and important that uh, uh, elements, the elements can uh, teach us something uh, about. Uh, so this is just to situate uh, some of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the thoughts that I'm going to unfold. Uh, and uh, before I really dive into it, I also want to actually mention uh, a few other contexts um, on the, that are simmering on the background uh, of what I'm uh, uh, talking about. So one uh, is related to media studies again, and that is uh, infrastructure studies, which is uh, part and parcel, I would say, actually of uh, elemental media. Infrastructure uh, studies actually focuses on uh, all the pathways and infrastructures that we need in order to get all our messages and, and media uh, to work. Think of satellites or sea cables, uh, etc. So that's really part of this elemental turn. Uh, on a philosophical level, the whole uh, new materialist uh, um, you know, paradigm that is by and large very much informed by Deleuze and Guattari, uh, is also uh, part of uh, this uh, thinking with the elements. Um, and we can just think here of the way in which uh, for Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari, the human and the non-human uh, actually have uh, profound connections. Um, think of uh, their uh, concepts of becoming, you know, how, you know, becoming animal uh, is a connection between a human and non-human. Um, so this just to um, situate that as a background, new materialism. And a third really big field that uh, is really also uh, a foundation of what I'm talking about and want to develop further uh, on uh, is the attention for decolonialism. And this uh, uh, is, uh, again, a much wider uh, uh, context and uh, paradigm shift in which we try to think uh, or unthink uh, the uh, dominance of Western uh, paradigms. So I hope that in the course of uh, uh, my uh, talk, these um, elements will resurface um, and you will, you know, uh, draw these, uh, these parallels and these lines. Okay, so if we then just move to fire and uh, think uh, about fire, it might be good to just first start with some associations we all have with fire. If you just take half, half a second <laughs> to think about what comes to mind um, when, uh, when we think of fire, um, I can just you know, uh, mention a wild association, which in fact starts with the sun, um, fossilized energy, which derives from the sun, electricity, the colors, yellow, orange, red. Danger, unpredictability, playing with fire, prohibition, destruction, purification, rebirth, phoenix, transformation, transience, domestication of fire, wildfire, fire of gods, Hestia, Vesta versus Hephaestus and Vulcan, Hermes, Mercurius, Prometheus, and Icarus, Sita and Radha, the fire dragon, and we can go on and on and on. Um, 
But um, what is very particular about this wild association, I'm going to bring some order hopefully in a minute, uh, but uh, what is very particular is that we can see that all this is a mixture of um, material and immaterial properties of, uh, of fire. Um, so how can we then think of fire as a, a medium? And first of all, I would like to I would like to keep this distinction between material and immaterial uh, on the one hand, and then of course it's all fundamentally related, but for the sake of the argument, um, I want to look at fire as a material medium in, on three different levels. Uh, one is uh, to look at what John Durham Peters has called fire as a tool of tools, as a meta medium. Uh, but there is also the element of fossilized energy or image as a fossil image of the sun um, and to think about heat and fire as environmental plasma. I will just briefly go through the, these three different uh, layers. So um, pyrotechnics, um, let me see. Yes, um, when we think of uh, uh, fire as a material uh, medium, again, uh, John Durham Peters says something very uh, important. He says, fire is a medium because it's an enabling environment for ash and smoke, ink and metal, chemicals and ceramics. Teamed with technique, fire makes matter malleable. Um, so what Peters here argues is that fire is a medium in itself, but it is also used to create other media, whether they are tools or whether they are inked or uh, uh, ashes that, that can uh, again, uh, 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 transpose uh, information. Um, and he also indicates, like all media, human fire is an ensemble of natural elements and cultural techniques, a means for creating other means. Fire is the mother of tools as well as a tool itself, a medium as well as the precondition for almost all human-made media. Fire is a meta-media. Okay, so if we have that level of fire as a meta medium, we can uh, then look at uh, the second element of the materiality of fire as a medium, um, which is actually argu argued by uh, Nadia Bozak um, um, in our book, The Cinematographic Footprint. And in this uh, uh, book, uh, Bozak actually uh, looks at, uh, she starts with this image, um, from Nanook of the North. Um, and um, she argues, we must uh, first locate the heart of cinema, um, its fuel and perhaps even its spirit, which is the sun. So the sun is really a, a most important source of, uh, of fire. Um, and the fossil image, uh, she argues, is the locus where geology, industrial civilization and cinematic hist history intersect into, an, uh, into a fusion uh, that can all be traced back to the light and energy that comes from the sun. And she starts her book with this image. Um, and she argues here, talking about this image, the relationship between moving images and the natural resources that sustain them, the relationship between the biosphere and, the cinema, and cinema's need for its energy are contained in a photograph taken by Robert Flaherty in 1922 uh, of an Inuk hunter, Alakarielak, now known as Nanook of the North. Um, she actually argues and returns to Dudley Andrews' essay, The Roots of the Nomadic, Medic, when she describes this image, um, where actually uh, uh, um, Dudley Andrew already uh, argued that what we see here um, is actually a, um, the seal we see uh, and the seal hunter uh, and the camera all um, uh, being defined as a mobile subaqueous source of oil. Um, and actually so the, the oil of the, the seal um, is used to uh, um, energize uh, the lamps of the projector. It, 
the seal is also used to energy just the body of the hunter. So it's all connected. So it's about this uh, connected uh, um, energy network, a circular economy of energy. And in this film is also takes part. Film is something intractably luminous measuring in one way or another our civilization's control of the sun in the form of the fossilized sun or carbon that we have captured, refined and duly exploited. So it's in this sense that uh, uh, another element of uh, the materiality uh, of fire uh, as fossilized energy is part of, uh, of cinema and of media culture more largely. And then a final uh, material element of uh, fire um, as, as, uh, is um, heat. So fire as in what David McCauley calls environmental plasma. Um, so in his book, Elemental Philosophy, Macaulay argues heat and cold are elemental because they greatly condition the environmental plasma in which we dwell and through which we evolve and move. The media of air, water and land that constitute an ambient setting or stage for ecological change, geological processes, cultural life. Fire as associated to the temperature of the climate we dwell in equally operates on our bodies and minds. So we have here another kind of media as more and something that enwraps us uh, as an environmental uh, plasma uh, that, that mediates uh, heat. And this uh, idea of uh, heat and uh, uh, as a medium is also taken up uh, by Nicole Starozielski in her book, Media Hot and Cold. Uh, she actually, uh, first returns to uh, McLuhan, uh, but then really takes up, um, uh, you know, a, a renewed interest in media as hot and cold, much more materially as uh, uh, thermal. Um, and uh, she argues the most powerful media organizations of the 21st century will be thermal. The circulation of images, sounds, videos, and text will depend on a massive regime of heating and cooling. Data and networks, like the people they connect, will be ever more fragile, too hot or too cold, and the platforms will collapse. Digital infrastructures, data centers, network exchanges, and fiber optic cables will drain the planet's energy in order to create a stable thermal environmental environment, not for people, but for information. So again, this was a, a quote, uh, a quote that indicates that uh, thinking about fire in terms of uh, ther its thermal qualities uh, becomes, will become or has become increasingly important. Um, we can also think, of course, of infrared cameras, uh, thermal heat uh, cameras um, um, you know, on the one hand, but of, of course, the cold and the uh, the cooling and the heating that we need in order to have our machines uh, uh, operate um, uh, are also of an increasing uh, importance. I cannot do justice to all the works that I'm citing here. I just want to really actually uh, point out that these are important uh, 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 thoughts and uh, uh, conceptual ideas that um, are already addressing. Um, fire as an uh, elemental uh, media um, in, in this, these different material uh, senses. So all these works actually uh, relate to uh, the media in respect to both nature and uh, social uh, uh, networks and actually also thought networks. So in that sense, um, I also already mentioned uh, Deleuze and Guattari, but also the three ecologies of Deleuze and Guattari uh, of um, um, material, uh, social, political, and ment mental ecologies through which all these elemental um, uh, fiery uh, media operate are uh, important to, uh, to keep, uh, keep in mind. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, these are the three um, material ways in which fire is a medium 
quite literally uh, as uh, as uh, in all its properties of um, um, heating and cooling down, uh, etc. But of course, I also and we already saw in the um, you know in the in the overview of the associations, there is a lot uh, uh, that we connect mentally and symbolically and mythically uh, to fire. So there is a, an entire uh, poetics of uh, fire, um, which is always actually already related to the material properties. Um, and Anne Harris, for instance, called, therefore prefers to speak not about metaphors, but metaphors of fire, uh, where there is always this uh, tight connection between the fire itself and what we how, what we associate it with. A very important thinker in uh, in uh, the thinking about the poetics and immaterial qualities of uh, fire as a medium uh, is actually uh, Gaston uh, Bachelard. And in his book, The Psychoanalysis of Fire, uh, Bachelard uh, talks about uh, the qualities, symbolisms, and um, imaginations of fire. And he really actually uh, refers to uh, the mind staring at a campfire, which is drifting off. He calls this the untutored mind. And in this sense, uh, his psychoanalysis, the psychoanalysis that he uh, is proposing, uh, is very different from Freud. Freudian psychoanalysis is about dreams, you know, and the, the, the unconscious, um, what comes when we are not consciously thinking. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of fire in our dreams uh, as well. But Bachelard is shifting the focus a little bit to staring at the campfire. And he actually distinguishes uh, mythic fire complexes. So he's not talking about the Oedipus complex, but he actually uh, develops several, and I will mention four, different complexes. One of them, uh, the first one that he distinguishes, is the uh, Empedocles complex. Um, and this uh, is uh, has to do with the ways in which uh, fire um, inspires awe, inspires respect, and also inspires maybe uh, a desire for annihilation. Uh, and Empedocles was uh, the Greek philosopher um, who allegedly jumped into the crater of the Etna. Um, and therefore, uh, he calls this the Empedocles uh, complex. So it has to do with um, uh, our the first uh, awe-inspiring uh, dimension that uh, we think of when we think of fire. Another complex that he distinguishes is the Prometheus complex. And this has to do with fire and knowledge, and especially uh, the knowledge that is forbidden. So uh, Bachelard argues that the fire actually is governed by a general prohibition. Uh, think of, um, you know, he says the first thing we learn about fire is that we should not touch it. Uh, and then um, think of um, the child you know, stealing matches, wanting to make, uh, you know, secretly a fire, even though it's forbidden. Um, so the Prometheus complex um, is what Bachelard actually calls the Oedipus complex of, um, um, of life of the intellect. So it's not governed by, uh, or driven by sexual knowledge, as is uh, the Oedipus complex. Um, and we all know uh, that uh, story and how Freud has developed that into a general psychological structure. But Bachelard uh, brings in the Prometheus complex, uh, where all our knowledge is actually based on what he calls a clever disobedience. We have to tran transgress uh, in order to uh, gain more and new knowledge. Okay, uh, the third uh, complex that he then distinguishes is uh, the Novalis complex. Um, this does uh, have to do, uh, has to do with uh, sec uh, sexualized fire and with uh, um, the knowledge of intimacy and sexuality. And here again, Bachelard doesn't, does not go back to Oedipus and the primal scene where the child sees the parents uh, uh, making love and which sets in uh, the complex. But uh, he calls this the Novalis complex after the romantic poet uh, who actually 
um, goes back to uh, the primitive ideas of uh, making fire, which is always uh, based on, uh, you know, you, the first uh, way of making fire is rubbing sticks, um, which is a, a, a sexualized kind of uh, um, act um, of nature. Electricity and the rhythms of uh, electricity also relates to uh, this idea of uh, electrifying and being on fire in a more sexualized or romantic uh, way. So this is related to Novalis. And then the last uh, complex and the last, you know, um, uh, poetry or imagination that we associate uh, with um, fire is what uh, uh, Bachelard actually calls the purifying powers of fire. And I propose to call this the Sita complex after the Hindu goddess Sita, who is the goddess of fire and the goddess of uh, purification. But we do know that uh, fire has to do with destruction and uh, rebirth. It has to do with uh, the idea of uh, uh, purification. So these are the four complexes uh, that um, uh, I want to uh, now elaborate on a little bit more in connection to some films. And I'll just check if um, how I am in time. Um, okay, so um, I, I will not uh, show uh, uh, any trailers because probably that will take uh, too much time. Uh, but uh, for each of these four complexes, I have one particular film uh, that is actually governed uh, by uh, one of these four complexes. They, of course, are never uh, standing on their on their own <laughs> in themselves. There, there's always connections, but uh, there are clear um, uh, dominances. So um, it's a, a recent film, Sarah Dose's documentary, uh, Fire of Love. Uh, is actually a film that really uh, uh, invites us uh, and actually gives us the experience of um, what it means uh, uh, that we are actually uh, fires doing, that we are so close to fire, actually. Uh, this film is uh, the film of two volcano, uh, volcanologues um, who are, uh, you know, they also fell in love uh, uh, themselves uh, uh, with each other, but basically they're bound by their love uh, of uh, uh, for volcanoes. And all their life, they uh, visited volcanoes, always came very, very close to the volcanoes and always took cameras with them uh, to film and to gain deeper knowledge uh, of, uh, of volcanoes. Uh, their research uh, has actually given us a lot of uh, information about uh, volcanoes and saved uh, a lot of lives uh, because we know much more about um, when and how to read the signs of the volcano. Uh, but they also um, were actually swallowed by a volcano uh, themselves in 1991 on Mount Unsen's uh, eruption uh, while they were on, uh, uh, at work. Um, the filmmaker uh, Sara Dosa um, um, argues uh, about uh, these, um, uh, you know, uh, Katja and Maurice Kraft, they are called, the volcanologues. Um, she argues, she says, the way that they live their life and the way they shot their material also allows others to enter into a relationship with volcanoes in their own way, whether it's just through curiosity or by perceiving, it's the ontology of volcanoes, so to speak. So this is what is being filmed here. The ontology of volcanoes reigned by the Empedocles uh, complex, uh, which really inspires this awe for this primordial uh, fire, but also how to deal uh, with fire. And this dealing with fire is an increasing uh, problem that uh, we are facing, uh, uh, um, you know, climate change, uh, wildfires are ramping everywhere. They have increased over the last uh, 10 years to uh, quite alarming degrees. Uh, and um, I think uh, all these elements are part of, um, you know, having to deal with our, uh, with Empedocles being in awe for fire and knowing 
how to deal uh, with fire. Um, I just want to briefly mention a film, uh, Only the Brave, uh, by Joseph Kosinski, uh, which is a film that uh, deals with firefighters who all actually, uh, like the volcanologues, uh, die in on their uh, duty. Um, but what I wa really want to bring in, uh, especially in this context, is, um, and this has to do with the whole uh, dimension of decolonizing uh, knowledge uh, in, in these elemental terms. Uh, this is the fact that um, increasingly uh, and slowly but surely, um, there is a new uh, reappreciation for indigenous uh, fire management and uh, cultural, uh, cultural burnings. Um, which is a knowledge that has always been there, that was uh, forbidden or pushed away uh, in favor of modern firefighting techniques, but uh, that actually is a technique that now in many places in the world uh, are being relearned. And so I think this is uh, a, a, another element of the Empedocles uh, complex to, um, you know, re learn how to deal with uh, fire. And uh, this is uh, an important uh, aspect of uh, uh, decolonizing uh, elemental media studies. Okay, um, I'm moving to uh, the second uh, complex, the Prometheus uh, complex. Um, and here we can uh, look at fire as uh, a form of combustive uh, knowledge. Um, the series that I want to mention here um, is Archive uh, 81, a Netflix uh, series, which um, is a series that turns around an archivist um, who is called uh, in for a secret mission to restore uh, tapes that have been burned uh, in a building. And actually, through this story of the archivist, the tapes that he restores actually transport us back into the 1990s um, and through uh, these 1990s uh, um, images that we also see in the series, um, yet other doors to other secret knowledges are being opened. Uh, the way in which I think this uh, is an interesting complex to bring in, uh, in uh, connection to um, media studies uh, is when we actually, as in the series is proposed, go back to the archives. And um, I, I'm thinking here of uh, archival work that is done by uh, artists who go back to the archive to, um, I call it the rekindling of uh, archival knowledge, but uh, to go back and find images that have actually uh, never been brought to the fore. Uh, so um, for instance, the work of Sarah Pierce and John Acomfra, uh, is uh, are you know both works that um, go back to official archives and find, for instance, uh, images of uh, migration, um, different type of images that we are used to uh, uh, in uh, dominant media uh, culture, and uh, really bring uh, and uh, rewrite actually uh, history by uh, adding new perspectives by adding. Uh, different types of, uh, of knowledges. This is something uh, that in going back to archive 80, uh, 81 is not exactly done. The type of knowledge that is brought back uh, in uh, this series is more um, secret, uh, alchemical and is esoteric uh, kind of uh, knowledge, which is interesting in itself. Um, uh, but I, I think the, the more political uh, dimension uh, that I just mentioned of reopening and finding uh, new images uh, or hidden images in uh, the archive uh, is, uh, is of fundamental importance. As I said, in Archive 81, it's more uh, alchemical, uh, you know, esoteric kind of knowledge uh, that is uh, uh, brought back. Um, in the series, it's imagined esoteric knowledge but there is a uh, whole um, uh, dimension, I'm, I'm skipping this, of um, alchemy uh, that uh, in itself is also uh, very interesting to uh, reconsider in connection to media. 
And here I briefly want to uh, refer to the work of uh, Eric De Davis, who in his book Technosis uh, actually uh, really talks about uh, um, alchemical fire and talks about the magic uh, and hidden knowledge that is actually part of uh, what he calls uh, technologies unconscious. So it seems very often that technology is purely scientific, etc. But there is a whole uh, almost magical, ghostly, uh, secret uh, dimension of technology uh, that yet again um, uh, is calling for more uh, attention. Um, and Davis uh, actually talks about, for instance, electricity. And we saw how that is actually an elemental media coming from the sun and how electricity was actually part of the beginning of modern media uh, technology. And he argues the transformation of electrical uh, current, uh, ethereal fire into a communication medium represents perhaps its most remarkable transmutation from energy into information. So how fire and energy transmutes into information uh, and other kind of context that we can see and read, uh, it has something to do with uh, these esoteric traditions and uh, al uh, alchemical fires. This was certainly uh, the case uh, in the 19th century when uh, there was more mystery surrounded uh, around uh, the introduction of all our media technologies, but it is still around uh, actually. Uh, and here I'm actually to, uh, referring to a more recent book, Stealing Fire by Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel, where um, uh, they uh, talk actually about uh, Silicon Valley uh, and uh, um, you know all kind of uh, you know high tech uh, innovating uh, startups and companies. Uh, who, in one way or another, again, are modern Prometheans who steal somehow uh, new knowledge uh, to bring uh, to the world. Uh, they also refer to, for instance, Burning Man, uh, you know, Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley's, let's say, um, elemental, uh, alchemical, unconscious, um, uh, they, Burning Man as a place uh, where a lot of the CEOs of uh, Silicon Valley uh, and other tech companies uh, propose very often their first uh, ideas, such as, uh, um, you know, uh, the test, uh, Elon Musk proposing the Tesla there uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. So it's still around this uh, Promethean uh, complex. Um, I'm going now very quickly, if I still have time, to the last two complexes. Um, the Novalis complex, I think, is very much embodied uh, in another very interesting film, uh, Emma, uh, Pablo Lorenz, uh, 2019 uh, film, uh, which is actually, it deals with a main character who is actually a pyro, uh, pyromaniac <laughs> uh, and a dancer uh, and somebody full of life who also actually wants to create uh, a different type of life, non-normative uh, life. And we could actually see here that this film is um, another form of uh, electricity, body elect electricity, dancing the body electric. Uh, what we see happening in this film um, is uh, that the main character through dancing uh, and through her relation to other characters uh, is looking for uh, um, uh, uh, pansexuality, but also uh, to create a different type of family. And at the end of the film, we actually see her uh, with uh, her child and um, let's say three different parents. <laughs> um, and she has somehow, it's an enigmatic film full of um, uh, life, vitality, transgression, um, looking for different types of uh, 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 organizing life, uh, all mediated by fire. She is regularly lighting fire within uh, the city. Um, and at the end of the film, we see her, as you can see her in one of the images, looking directly at the camera. But right after that, we also see her filling up another uh, uh, tank uh, uh, fuel. 
so she will continue probably uh, to uh, keep on uh, trying to transform life and dancing uh, this um, electrifying uh, um, body. Um, so uh, the last film that I want uh, to mention uh, uh, is Meta Deepa's um, uh, film called Fire, and this is part of her trilogy. Uh, the other uh, two films are about water or are called Water and Earth. Uh, but this film is about two women, Rada and Sita, um, who actually find each other in the same house household. They are uh, married to brothers, but both their husbands are actually, uh, you know, called, they are both lonely and locked up in their marriage and they find comfort um, um, with each other. Uh, this causes a lot of, uh, um, you know, anger and at the end of the film um, one of the the women is uh, you know catching fire and she um, becomes like a, a modern day uh, Sita goddess who in the end of the film is also purified um, uh, so this film um, we can argue uh, and this actually inspired me to call this purifying fire the Sita complex uh, it deals with destruction and rebirth. Um, it also deals with um, uh, uh, fiery debates. Uh, and because when the film came came out, uh, not everybody uh, could appreciate uh, its uh, uh, transgressive, uh, but actually loving uh, kind of um, uh, a message. Uh, the film passed. Uh, censorship uh, they they all uh, you know the censors thought this film was um, you know was following all the rules um, but uh, the Shiv Sena Hindu Nationalist Party uh, really attacked the film the posters the theaters um, set fire and made demonstrations when and if the film uh, was screened um, so this also this part the fiery debate that films can uh, uh, create um, is part of um, thinking with fire uh, in connection to media. And this is uh, the last uh, element of uh, what I want to bring to the fore. And I, uh, here I refer to uh, Wei Hong Bao's uh, beautiful book uh, called Fiery Cinema. Uh, and Bao really takes up uh, and she starts a book with the, uh, a a controversy um, in uh, around uh, a film screening uh, in Shanghai um, uh, in um, uh, the early 1910s. Um, so the uh, the way in which certain films can provoke fire also with the audience uh, is is again you know an element of uh, fire as a medium. Um, Bao argues in, in her book. Fire is an unstable medium, straddling a material, an image, and a technology with tremendous effective power, animating, metamorphosing, and corroding. It moves across space and time as an agent of simultaneous assimilation and perpe perpetual differentiation. The competition between cinema and fire hence suggests a more fundamental reconception of the medium. It is a notion of the medium as a mediating environment. So what we see here also is that fire, uh, when we bring it in connection to uh, cinema and to the media, is that it also uh, opens up um, the medium as a mediating environment. And in this case, the mediation between what's on screen what's, uh, and what is happening to the spectators. And that can cause actual real fire. Um, so fire is very much an effective uh, medium, um, which, um, uh, um, uh, you know, an effective medium and as a mediating environment, which has the power to stir past passions, it can frame and mediate perception and mold experiences. So all that I have been talking about in, you know, uh, in a nutshell and in, in big steps and leaps uh, shows that uh, fire mediations present different kinds of combustive knowledge in which the element of fire, both as a material phenomenon 
of nature and engine for modern life, as well as an immaterial reverie um, of forbidden knowledge, of sexuality, of death and rebirth, uh, are worthwhile exploring further in the light in uh, in light of the deeper elemental questions that wait to be rekindled in the different ecologies of flames that surround us and media us mediate us today. Okay. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much for this inspiring presentation. Thanks a lot. Oh, I have fire of the sun now on coming in through a window. <laughs> I'll just close, uh, hang on, I'll close uh, some curtains. <laughs> So, would you mind if we ask some questions about your speech and about sure. your works? Okay, um, sure. I'm gonna start with the first question. Actually, this is a question for me. Uh, yeah. Normally, we can say that lots of people evaluate fire as a danger or a risk or maybe a hazard, or we sometimes relate it with the hell, or maybe mm -hmm. we see it as a source of punishment, you know? Mm -hmm. What do you think about the positive connotations of fire in modern cinema? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> fire certainly is dangerous, um, and uh, but it's also necessary, right? So, but uh, it's true. I didn't focus a lot in my talk about, uh, um, let's say, the hell. <laughs> I got this question uh, before. Somehow it was not uh, on my mind, but certainly there, it's, it's part of, of what we associate with fire. Um, the positive uh, elements, I think, is that if we just look at the primordial fire to start with, the sun, there wouldn't be any life without uh, the sun, you know? So it, it, it's essential. And that's, you know, it's something in that sense, it's affirmative, it's positive. We need the warmth of the sun. We need uh, the energy that uh, the sun gives us. Uh, things need light to grow. Um, so all that I think is very positive. But of course, uh, there is much more to it because then that light is captured not only in our bodies, but also in our objects, in the earth itself, in uh, the elements that we ex extract from that and then transform that further into our media. So for me, it, it's it's very uh, positive, but you're totally right that um, there it's dangerous too. <laughs> I had no time to show the first uh, the the clip about fire of love, but then you also you feel the danger uh, when you look at the work of these volcanologues who come so close, and you just know, you know, it's it's a non-human force. Uh, that uh, and that's another element I think why it's important today that we have this elemental turn today because the non-human elements whether it's climate or, or all kind of you know other non-human forces they become more prominent again we thought for a long time that we could control everything but for, for sure that's not the case so i think um, feeling that danger is also a warning and something to be moder more modest as we humans you know we're part of all these forces and not on top of them at least not always <laughs> thanks Bob, for this great answer we have, we have another question it's a little bit long so i'm trying to read it as slowly as possible okay uh, actually it says it's not exactly related to the topics you have covered today Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, getting your opinions on this issue is really crucial for us. Mm -hmm. You have included the relationship between cinema and the brain on a philosophical level with the concept of narrow images. Mm -hmm. The point of reach today, in the light of the information we have acquired reg regarding the brain, especially mm -hmm. the approach of the plastic structure of the brain, mirror neurons and embodied mind come to the fore. So in this context, when it comes to the movie audience, what kind of methodology can researchers who want to examine their movie experience follow in the light of philosophy and neuroscience, but without 
any reduction, this is the crucial point here, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you recommend? This is the final question about this, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's an important and interesting uh, question. I, I was not really addressing that uh, today indeed, but I, of course, continue to be really interested in, in the brain and, um, and certainly uh, propose not to look at this in a reductionist uh, manner. I think uh, there are several answers uh, to, to this. Uh, one is um, interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinary uh, research is, is, uh, is, can be a solution. It's difficult because precisely because hard sciences very often need to be reductionist in order to be able to do an experiment. Because if you, you ex make an experiment, you need to really be able to compare things and to be able to calculate. If you're not reductionist, that doesn't work. Uh, so if, but if you can combine that kind of work with a more philosophical approach, look at what would be the implications, what does it mean on a more phenomenological level, um, that could work, I think. So interdisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, research is, is one uh, uh, answer. Um, on the other hand, it is also uh, not all uh, neuroscientists are purely reductionist. Uh, there is a, an entire strand within uh, neu neuroscience that also actually acknowledges the embodied uh, nature uh, of, uh, um, you know, of our brain. Um, so uh, embodied neuroscience is, you know, it is more and more recognized, but still then if you want to do an experiment, you somehow need to reduce. So you would always need, you know, some, you know, interdisciplinary reflection or, or connection. So in fact, maybe that would be the, the real answer. We need to talk to each other and see what are the limits of each of our, uh, the different types of knowledge that we, we uh, can bring, put on the table, to the table and see how, how uh, that uh, uh, combines and how we can learn from, uh, from each other. In fact, that was a little bit what I was trying to do in uh, my book, the, the Neuroimage. I looked at findings of neuroscience and then look at, so what does this mean for understanding cinema? Um, what uh, does cinema or philosophy bring maybe also back? Uh, to uh, neuroscience. I don't know if that's, is, is that a, an answer, <laughs> more or less? I think it's a very satisfying answer. Thanks a lot. <laughs> is there a question from our audiences? It seems not. Thanks a lot for your participation. I think it's a great experience for us to share, sharing your ideas and listening to you. Thanks a lot again and again for, for the Cine, Cine Philosophy uh, Journal. Thank you so oh, much. Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs>